Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful, wonderful to see all of us here gathered together for such a beautiful, beautiful occasion. I'm Marcelo Suarez Orozco, and I have the great responsibility and honor to serve as your chancellor. And I'm so delighted to welcome you this afternoon to UMass Boston's annual Distinguished Faculty Lecture. Established in 1978, the Chancellor's Awards for Distinguished Scholarship, Distinguished Service, and Distinguished Teaching are presented each year to three faculty members who have made exceptional contributions in these critical domains of faculty responsibility. Honorees are invited then to address our community at this lecture to share reflections on the award, their work at UMass Boston, and everything they do for our community. Today, it is my pleasure to be honoring the 2023 recipients of the Chancellor's uh, Awards. Professor Tiffany Donaldson in the Department of Psychology, recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Teaching. An innovative, culturally responsible, engaged, inspiring classroom teacher who always serves her students, colleagues, and the staff. She is also director of the Research Education Core within the UMass Boston Dana-Farber Harbor Cancer Center U54 program. Professor of Psychology and Associate Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, David Pantalone, recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Scholarship. David's research focuses on health, inequities, and the physical and mental health of our stigmatized, vulnerable communities. He continues to advance UMass Boston's anti-racist, health-promoting mission. And Professor Rachel Skiversky in the Department of Biology. I'm glad we broke the pattern, Rachel, with the uh, <laughs> recipient, and we have a little joke here, Rachel and I, recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Service. Rachel's work on diversifying STEM education at UMass Boston and in the Boston Public Schools has established Rachel as a national leader in this important space and has made our university a model for success in STEM education for our underrepresented communities. It's been a year now since the launch of our strategic plan for the times. And perhaps the distinguished faculty lecture series is, of course, one of the many, many ways we recognize these milestones and shine light on UMass Boston's academic excellence, teaching excellence, excellence in service. At the core for the times, it's about building on our 
singular ability to bring together people, perspectives across disciplines, create exceptional academic programs and experiences to serve the greater good. Given the extraordinary challenges the world is facing today, nothing perhaps is more important than work that endeavors to serve the greater good. So to our three 2023 distinguished faculty members, we are so proud to see your work recognized and so grateful to each of you for your passion, for your commitment, for your outstanding scholarship, teaching, and service. The three fundamental prongs of a public research university making a difference. All of us are grateful for your leadership, and we're all looking forward to your presentations. Please accept de todo corazón. Adán, you can translate that for the folk that don't speak Spanish. De todo corazón. From my heart, our congratulations and best, best wishes for continued excellence at UMass Boston. Muchas, muchas gracias. With that, it's now my pleasure to introduce our provost, Joe Berger, uh, who needs no introduction. That, that's my job is to say, now my job is to introduce a widely respected scholar in higher education, leader, Provost Berger, embodies UMass Boston's deep commitment to rigorous student-centered education. I personally feel extremely lucky to have Provost Berger work with us day in and day out. Joe. Thank you, Marcelo. Good afternoon. You know, we have many joyous occasions to celebrate all of the great accomplishments and work that our faculty do here at UMass Boston. This is right at the apex of those celebrations and events. And as the chancellor noted, right, these awards, um, these are special awards because they are at the heart of our mission right, as Boston's great public research university. You know, our tripartite mission that is driven by our commitment to holistic student success through teaching, impactful research, and scholarship and service to our community that begins with the integrity of doing work that matters to our local communities as a foundation for impact nationally, internationally, um, for so many people who benefit from the work that we do. And to be selected for the Chancellor's Awards is really quite remarkable when you think about the extraordinary talent that we have across our faculty. But I feel that, actually very humbled to be here today with our three honorees, each of whom I've had the privilege to get to know over the last few years, and to continue to be impressed, not only by their work, but by who they are as scholars, who they are as teachers, who they are as mentors, but who they are as leaders in multiple ways that not only build better careers for themselves, really make a difference for who we are as a university and for the communities and people that depend on us to deliver our mission. So I'm going to introduce each of them 
in turn. So this is the first of uh, four times you're going to get to see me since I'll wrap things up also. Um, but I do want to say that in, we are going to learn a lot from our three honored guests this afternoon. I'm looking forward to it. But I think that it's also an opportunity for all of us to really appreciate the fact that we have such special talent here at, at UMass Boston. So um, before I go into the first introduction, let's give um, the first of many rounds of applause this afternoon for Tiffany and Rachel and David. All right, so first up, um, we're going to start with the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Teaching, of which Professor S. Tiffany Donaldson so richly has earned and deserves. Tiffany's been here for 26 years and has had a profound impact in her department, in multiple colleges, um, and throughout the entire university through her teaching, mentorship, supervision, and leadership. She's demonstrated excellence across a range of undergraduate behavioral neuroscience courses, graduate level clinical experiences, as well as upper level seminar in the Honors College that blends neuroscientific approaches to addiction with perspectives from the arts, sociology, and other disciplines. As the Chancellor noted, Tiffany has been described as an innovative, culturally responsive, engaged, inspiring classroom teacher by her colleagues, and is lauded as a dedicated, transformative, anti-racist teacher and mentor. That's always been incredibly important. In this day and age, we're more aware than ever before of how essential those perspectives and that work is at the very heart of what we do as, as an institution. Her commitment to mentoring undergraduate and graduate students in her research lab, as well as her service in mentoring junior faculty, is to be commended. She is continually innovating in the classroom to keep students and colleagues engaged. And in addition, she has served, I'm not even going to go through all of the different leadership roles. I'm just going to highlight a few, um, which includes having served as a board member on CIT here on campus, certified as a mentor trainer through the NIH-funded National Research Mentoring Network, through which she has offered monthly training workshops on campus, introducing faculty to anti-racist and culturally aware practices in student mentoring. She has served as the co-director of the Office of Health Disparities and Research Training Program and currently serves as the director of the Research Education Corps within the UMass Boston Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center U54 program. But wait, there's more. She's also um, in CEHD currently providing leadership as associate dean um, in, and director for the School for Global Inclusion and Social Development. Both her undergraduate and graduate research students have received holistic mentoring and empowerment to succeed in presenting and publishing their work, which has seen them earn their own awards, fellowships, and secure employment after graduation. To all of us, Professor Donaldson is a true inspiration and is a model transformative teacher and mentor. I've also had the privilege of seeing her participate in a leadership development program where she not only benefited from the program, but she benefited the others who were in the program with her. Tiffany. It's my real honor and pleasure to welcome you to the podium so that we can learn from you about what it means to be a transformative teacher and mentor. I teach at UMass Boston. I chose UMass Boston because I want to make space um, for people who look like me. I've been in science classrooms in conferences and spaces where I've been told I don't belong, no matter how many years I've been doing this, how many accolades I have. So I decided to make my classroom a transformative space, an inclusive space. We have 
so many statistics that let us know just how um, bad we are in this area. There are gaps in um, all areas of degrees in science and engineering based on race, race ethnicity. So even though we have diversity and tipping towards uh, minority majority in our US population, especially for 18 to 13, 34 year olds, we are still showing huge disparities in those who receive degrees. So as you go down this chart, um, getting a doctorate degree, you're less likely to receive it if you're Asian compared to white counterparts. You're less likely if you're Hispanic or Latin A, and certainly um, American Indian and Native, Alaskan Natives as well. There are huge disparities in publishing, and many of you are probably aware of disparities that exist as well in grantsmanship, our series grants. Dispar disparities that when you control for all other factors, the institution, the type of research, there's still um, glaring disparities around race and ethnicity, especially for black and brown faculty members. And so this graph shows that the um, blue represents underrepresentation. So there's severe underrepresentation of publishing and STEM-related courses for Latin A women, black women, and white women. Um, to just bring us local, there's some big changes and shifts in BPS as well. I've also been very committed to BPS and done a lot of work there over the years. But we are seeing stark declines in our BPS students who are going and entering in college. Um, this is most true, again, for our black, our Latin A, and our Asian students relative to our white. So Latin A on the left here, this is from 2017 to 21, um, drops in students' enrollment from BPS. And if you look at the national average um, across 2014 to 2023, BPS wasn't doing terrible. They were at the national average. Um, but after 2017, which I don't have to mark this for many of you, um, changes related to the pandemic, changes related to um, social climate, um, there is an even bigger drop off in the number of BPS students who are enrolling in college degrees. There are also gender gaps, um, where course enrollment is about equal in middle school in high school, there's a huge gap that emerges from the first year of college that continues. And I also shouldn't have to tell you that there's huge disparities in representation of who gets um, Nobel Prizes in STEM-related fields. 97% um, for men, um, largely white, white men, and only 3% are women recipients. And this um, final graph also shows uh, gaps in STEM majors. So the non-STEM majors are in the red bars, um, the men on the left side of this graph and women on the right side. No difference between groups among the men. Um, higher uh, course enrollment majors for non-STEM majors for women. Um, but I'll point you to the orange graphs here. The bar graphs are showing that there are more males who are in the physical STEM than there are females and again, racial ethnic gaps that exist as well. So like I said, I'm my grandmother's daughter, so I came here to make sure that my classroom was a classroom that saw women, saw racial ethnic minority students, and created environments that said, yes, you can, you're capable, you should be in STEM, you have something to offer, your voice is needed. And so I did that by having flipped classrooms. The students would come in, sure they put their things down, but they were up shortly after brought them to the board. Tell me what you know. Tell me what you understand about these topics. So I'd have the topics around the board. They got all the content. They were actually outperforming my classes when I didn't do a flip classroom. Got them moving. I also invite them to talk about what they know and their sources of knowing. So they're invited to bring TikTok videos, YouTube videos, and talk about what they understand about the topic that we're covering. Um, I value their lived experiences. You know, Take a moment, if you haven't, and ask your students what they do. I had a pharmacy assistant. I had a former PA who wanted to be, come back and get a different major. I had people who had lived experiences, and I'm sitting up there talking about something that's very basic for them. I would be remiss if I didn't take the time to ask who was in the room to figure out what I can learn from them and what they can offer their classmates. I also make sure that they understand how they learn. So we do some um, 
allow them to do some um, work to figure out their learning styles if they don't yet know it, and then work with them to make sure that the material is accessible in that learning mod modality. And I'm also constantly getting feedback from them. I don't wait until the end of the semester. How did that one land? How did that one land? What could I do better? And I try to name that I read that, and I'm trying something different because I read that feedback. Um, and I also make sure that there's scaffolding. I make sure that there's, there are opportunities for me to support them where they are. If you don't know this, a lot of BPS um, teachers are teaching math science courses, and they may not be certified in those areas. And so don't blame the student when they come there, not yet prepared or absent of foundational skills. I view their performance on exams, my means, as an indictment of me. So if it's a low mean, what did I do that my students can access this and demonstrate their learning? And so I reevaluate that, and I also get feedback from them. I also, the research shows that if you actively reduce stereotype threat, you can engage and increase um, learning, especially around STEM, um, STEM classes and STEM performance. And so I'm always telling my students that they're busting it out, they're amazing, they read that article, they understand that I give them the opportunity to present it, to be teachers, so they're always sharing the podium space with me, to present as group. You reduce what is already being activated just by them being in your classroom in a STEM-related field um, by telling them that they're more than capable and that they can perform. I also make it creative and fun. This is like a dream come true because I love games. I play board games all my life. So I created board games around the content in the classes. And so we play Taboo, Neuroscience Jeopardy, Psychopharmacology Jeopardy. I've had students who were undergrads here who took the courses with me and one is now one of the leaders of um, faculty, it stands fun, is Lisa Mang here? Faculty for undergraduate neuroscience teaching, she's on um, the committee working with that now. So the student who was in my classroom is now using those things to, it's an international organization to talk about how do you make um, science courses, neuroscience in particular, more accessible to undergraduates. How do you engage them? How do you keep them actively learning? So I played all these games with them and more. I encourage group work so they're required to work together. I'm like, I know, person's not responding. It's difficult. You work better by yourself. And science is a team sport. You need to get in there and find your team and work with your team. And so I really require group work, and I work with them when things are a little sticky around that. We have friendly competition, competitions throughout the semester that all are extra credit that goes towards exams, um, lab reports, et cetera. We even do Play-Doh art. Um, I've had music um, majors create pieces around content that I accept as final projects, um, demonstrating their learning, and they have to write and describe the piece and explain it relative to the content of the course. Here's some pictures from one of my classes. We were studying pharmacogenomics. Doesn't look like it, right? We were talking about um, some of the um, structural, systemic um, factors that contribute to not everyone having their genes um, represented so that when new medicines come out, black, Latin A, brown people don't have access to some of these new medications because we've not been participating in some of these studies. And so we talked about some of the core concepts related to pharmacogenomics and the Human Genome Project and trying to understand genes that contribute to dysfunction. And then I gave them a bunch of Play-Doh and they had to connect to content. They um, were in small groups, they created projects and then they had to present it to the class um, how that was related to the content. Um, I also endorse anti-racist pedagogy, so I'm checking myself, my own biases, I'm checking to make sure that there is representation in who I present as the purveyors of knowledge, who produces it, make sure that it's as wide and varied as my student population, so that they see themselves and they see what I'm presenting um, as I'm endorsing this as this is appropriate, that you can be in this place, you can produce this knowledge, and um, people who produce this knowledge look like you. Um, I also have classes where I encourage social activism. So the course in Honors College 
was focused on opioid addiction. And we talked about some of the structural and systemic factors that contribute to differences in treatment access and differences in how the media portrays it and how we talk about opioid addiction for white middle class versus poor black people, poor white people. And so then they have to go into certain spaces and present what they learn to medical professionals, to um, uh, in, uh, outpatient clinics, and so trying to also give them a voice outside of the classroom to use their knowledge and share it. And also do community engaged work. Just one correction, I'm not the director of the Research Education Corps. Every time I hear it, I'm like, oh shoot, I need to tell them. It's the Outreach Corps for the U54. And I do work in communities around um, cancer disparities, and I send students out into community agencies like churches and um, trusted and true um, leadership and people with expertise and make sure that I honor the experts in those community settings as well. And in this opportunity working with students, encourage them to recognize expertise and community members and what they bring to the table. And at my bench, in my lab, I also saw it as a place for disruption. So I've had so many women, so, so many um, uh, women with intersectional identities, um, gender identities, make sure that you see yourself as a scientist. You develop the core skills that you need, you get all the training that you need, and you get the um, self-efficacy, self-agency, all the things that we know make you better at what you do by seeing people who look like you, by getting leadership on projects, my students, my undergraduates. I have a former undergrad in the room who uh, is working on several publications. Um, my students get to become trainers. This former undergrad is uh, primarily responsible for training my now graduate student because of the time that they spend in the lab and the training and the sense of agency that they have um, and that I uh, offer for them. My students, as um, Joe mentioned, have been published, have gotten grants, have gone on. I'm not interested in producing more Tiffany's. I'm interested in making sure that people look like me or who are from marginalized identities recognize that they can do anything. And so using my classroom, my science lab as a platform to build that competency, to build that confidence so they can go anywhere. There are people who do go on and get PhDs. Uh, I mentioned my student who has a PhD from the University of Southern Florida, and she is one of the lead contributors to this fund organization. I have students in industry and students who've gone on, but um, I'm most grateful to my students because they're uh, the reason I'm here. They're the reason that I teach, and my teaching has involved, evolved the way that it has because I'm always trying to make more room for more people so that they can go off and do the amazing things they're, um, they're meant to do. And I'm also very proud that every single publication I've had since being at UMass Boston has included an undergraduate author who has bumped into me in the hallway, has heard about me from colleagues, thanks to all the colleagues who send me students over the years. Um, I've been involved with Rachel's programming and um, Bill's programming around McNair-funded students. So I just want to thank, first of all, the students, because I know that I'm who I am in the classroom and um, beyond because of the students I met here at UMass Boston. I'm grateful for, again, the challenge to continue to develop and to think about ways to invite you in, to include you, and to make you better at what you do. I'm very grateful to my dear friend and colleague, Liz Romer, for thinking of me for this award. Um, trying not to cry. It's really meaningful. I have, I really feel like I'm supposed to be in the classroom for this reason. And um, it was really nice to be honored because this is so meaningful to me. And also grateful to Drs. Karen Suyamoto and Randy Corpus, opportunity to be mentored and to mentor them and to push me beyond clicking slides in the classroom. Thank you. Well, I'm inspired. And um, Tiffany, thank you for sharing um, your passion, but the breadth and the depth of your commitment to teaching, mentoring, advising across undergrads, grads, counted at least three different colleges there. Um, it really 
is at the heart of who we are, are and what we do. You know, and again, it's not an accident that holistic student success is the first strategic priority in our strategic plan. And if that's not the definition, right, of how we provide holistic opportunities, where we not just teach our students, but learn with and from them, I don't know what is. OK, so since we just spoke about teaching, it means it's time for a pop quiz. All right, so is everybody ready for a pop quiz? OK, that's, no, that's the wrong attitude. <laughs> All right, single question. Who wants to go take a class from Tiffany right now? So great job, Tiffany. Thank you. All right, we're just getting started. So now, again, it's my great honor and privilege to introduce this year's Chancellor's Award for St Distinguished Scholarship winner, David Pantalone, Professor of Psychology and Associate Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. Yeah, let's clap. Yeah. So you know, I have a few, like, lots of formal things I could read about David, but I want to say two things more informally to start. One, I think it says something about um, a scholar and the impact of their research when I was a dean of a different college. I wasn't even provost yet, and I was already hearing about David's work. Um, you know, I think that says something. And now, very important then, once I became provost, I had the chance to start getting to know David a little bit. And Anybody who's as passionate about dogs as David is, is a wonderful person. So just let me say that. So David and I have bonded over that, among other things, um, including great scholarship. You know, and David's scholarship and research is absolutely, doesn't just keep with the spirit, but helps define the spirit of what impactful research and scholarship means here at UMass Boston. His research focuses on addressing health inequities and the physical and mental health of stigmatized vulnerable populations. He's made distinguished contributions in multiple areas spanning risk factors and HIV status, healthcare utilization, and medical adherence, as well as identity-based health disparities facing sexual and gender minority populations, especially those with oppressed intersectional identities. Dr. Panalone's record of external funding, awards, and professional appointments provide additional compelling evidence of his stature and impact. Since earning tenure, Dr. Panalone and his colleagues have obtained nearly $19 million in external funds. His work is both theoretically informed and practically applicable. As a consummate collaborator, and you know, I've always been impressed um, with David's ability to collaborate and certainly reading the nominations and supporting documentation for this award, Dave, David's work shows that we can do more together. But I think that collaboration takes actually a lot of work. Um, it's true many hands make light lifting, except for when you're the person who is juggling, leading, catalyzing multiple research teams, that's a lot of effort. Um, there's a lot of reward, but it's a lot of effort. So when you look at right, how much he's not just worked with colleagues and students here on campus, but colleagues from other institutions and agencies, but local community partners as well, it spans the gamut. It's truly impressive. And it's locally and it's nationally. So his contributions are further evidenced by his fellow status at ABCT and across multiple divisions of the APA. His broad range of professional and editorial positions, his prolific and original scholarship, his commitment and skill at cultivating the next generation of clinical health psychology researchers, and all of the awards he's already received that acknowledge and celebrate his accomplishments. His he has advanced the understanding of health in marginalized populations, generated culturally situated and empirically based theories, and set the standards for research on cross-disciplinary health research. The impact of David's contributions cannot be overstated. Dr. Pantalone's scholarship is exceptional in so many ways, 
and we are very fortunate to have him here as a colleague. And David, now we look forward to celebrating you and hearing more about your wonderful work. David Panelone. All right. Um, it's like I have to be on my tiptoes. OK. Um, <laughs> th thanks for coming. I wanted to start off with some gratitude for this award. Uh, Chancellor Soros Orozco, Provost Berger, um, thanks to the award selection committee, um, the psychology department, especially uh, Jean Rhodes and Heidi Levitt, who nominated me. And I, um, they, you know, one of the things you learn as a as a grad student and a scholar is about how to handle rejection. And I think they nominated me for this award like 400 times. So um, it's, a, it's a, a study in bouncing back from rejection. And congrats to Tiffany, Tiffany and Rachel, well-deserved. I, I wanted also to take a moment to, to express gratitude for my colleagues uh, for the work that we do together, especially my mentor, Steve Safran, now at Miami, and my grad school advisor, Jean Simone, who just moved to NIH. Um, my 14 amazing past and present doctoral students and the 60 students who've worked in the lab. I wanted to thank the psychology department for all of the support that I received while I was there and my dean's office colleagues who tolerate my research career, uh, taking me out of all of our important work together there. Um, <clears throat> my collaborators and co-authors, too many to list. I chose the nine who I have funded projects with. And Scopus is like a place where you can go to see how many citations you have, and whatever, says that I've published with 239 different co-authors. And so I'm not sure I could pick all of them um, out of a, anyway. OK, so, um, and my clients and our, and our study participants, that part of being a clinical psychologist, one of the best things about it is that I get so many of my research ideas from my work with, uh, um, my work with real people who present to us with real problems that need to be solved. So that makes me feel inspired to do that with them. Um, we're on theme today, although Tiffany and I didn't actually coordinate, but I mean, we're twins basically, so this happens all the time. Um, because all science is team science, <laughs> and um, that it just isn't possible. And to win an award like this makes it seem like it's some sort of individual contribution when really it's so many people, it's all the people that I named and more. Um, that I, uh, my first job was, uh, was a docent, basically at a science museum, where I, it was education and science coming together, and it was very meaningful to me, and obviously would portend my future. Um, the, uh, I thought, uh, later I thought that one way to be helpful to society would be to be a lawyer. Any lawyers in the room who I'm about to offend? Okay, and so, um, at least I asked, right? Um, but, but I did decide eventually that it really it wasn't for me because being a lawyer means being adversarial, and I think it would be better a better match for me would be a career that was more relational. And being a lawyer means um, paying, paying a lot of attention to precedent. It's really in the past when I think the past is important, of course, but I think it's important also to use science and figure out what's true now. Um, and so the difference between precedent and empiricism. So I ended up where I ended up. I'm glad to be here. Who am I as a scholar? Uh, so I am a clinical health psychologist. I trained at Brown. Uh, I'm a public school kid from Philadelphia. So um, Brown was a, that was a big change. Um, University of Washington, Seattle VA, Hunter College. I've done a lot of my work locally at Fenway Health, which is an LGBT health center. Um, there's so much more than that, but that's, that's sort of how they started. And the Fenway Institute, which is their research arm. And I study as, as um, as they said, the intersections between physical and mental health, and think of that uh, clinical health psychology really as having the two parts, the factors that contribute to physical health or illness, that's the sort of before, and then coping with health problems, um, including healthcare engagement, that's sort of the after. And most of my work has been with populations of people who are living with HIV um, and sexual and gender minority folks. So that's an acronym that we use in my subfield. That's, it's like LGBT, but even more broad, because there are lots of people who are non-cisgender, non-heterosexual, who don't use LGB or T as an identity label, but who still belong under that umbrella. <clears throat> so all of my work really goes in the direction of trying to reduce identity-related health disparities um, through intervention development. That's a jargon for therapy, <laughs> therapy interventions. Um, 
in intervention development, testing, and dissemination. And re really, my work's focused on stressful or traumatic events, so discrimination experiences and, and victimization at the interpersonal and the structural levels. And my work is quantitative, it's qualitative, but always it's moving in the direction of, um, of the question of so what. So what did we learn in this study that we can move into practice? So that's, that's the, the kind of question that has moved me. And most of my work has been community engaged, interdisciplinary. I almost never work with other clinical psychologists, actually. Nothing against clinical psychologists, N not lawyers, but. Um, <clears throat> And it's important to me, I consider a part of my scholarship, part of my scholarly career is about training and mentoring students and junior colleagues who want to, who want to be on this path with me. So the path, um, fortunate, I feel very fortunate to be here with the strong social justice values of the institution. I, I really didn't expect to end up in the kind of arts and sciences context that even 15, 20 years ago when I was finishing my training, it was a different moment in terms of who who arts and sciences folks, psychology departments were hiring and what, dis, what uh, sub-disciplines you know, they were really focusing on. It, in those days, really, you had to, if you were interested in studying sexual and gender minority health disparities, you could only really do it through the lens of a disease. And so for studying sexual minority men's health, so gay and bisexual men, that was through HIV. Um, and studying the health of sexual minority women was through smoking, cancer. So, there was that, um, but that, that's, that was also a time, I mean, really before that was my, my own queer coming of age in the 90s, which was, we say, like the bad old days of, of HIV, HIV discovered in 1981 in the empirical literature, 96 is when the meds got really good and everyone stopped dying. So, but, but I was in there and I thought that part of, what, part of what I feel also motivated by is thinking about that history and the people who died and thinking about how important it is to make sure to fight this preventable disease in the present. And you know, doing this work, <laughs> there, there are barriers. When, when I was a grad student, my, my mentor um, and her wife had an, uh, one of their studies called out on the floor of Congress because it was about sex. This is what was happening even in 2004. Um, and so there are um, there are barriers to doing this work, and yet it's so important important to push forward. Um, you'll, you'll see I'm going to pr present to you some, some of the ideas from my work. And, but I think for a long time I struggled with, you know, who, who am I? What do I study? Um, I study so many constructs, maybe too many. I think a lot of people in psychology study content like depression, but I'm more of a population person, focused on the populations that I was just telling you about. And... I think I got the criticism early that maybe my research had too many strands. It was just confusing, but I'm up here with the award, so I guess it didn't, <laughs> didn't go so bad, huh? <clears throat> all right. So all of these photos are, <laughs> is this humble bragging? I don't really understand what that means, but um, all of these are uh, sunrises that I saw from my office um, here on campus. So this was an especially beautiful one. They're all this semester. I, um, part of what it means to have all those strands of research is that I haven't actually slept since 2002. Um, so, okay, we're gonna, we'll, we'll do it step by step. Um, so studying stressors, that's, that's important. Studying mental health, that's important. Studying physical health and functioning, that's important. The meta model of all my work is how one of those leads to the next. There are um, three important theor theoretical frameworks that guide my work. One is my, the minority stress model, which I'll say more about. One is a syndemics framework, which I'll say more about. And then one is the HIV care cascade, which I'll say a little bit more about. And so the minority stress model has this, this idea in which and any person, really the minority stress model comes from the sexual, the literature about sexual minority folks, but it's really anyone with a marginalized identity says that they, they experience all of the same stressors, all of the same traumas that everyone does, and more. So all of the general plus all of the specific related to their identities. And then in, um, in HIV, there's this idea of, it's really, it actually comes from medical anthropology, Merrill Singer, this idea of syndemics, multiple co-occurring psychosocial epidemics, these uh, psychosocial problems that cluster together. And um, it's these four in, for sexual minority folks and HIV. It's depression and PTSD, really, substance use, uh, 
partner abuse, and that's childhood sexual abuse. It wouldn't fit. Um, so looking at those, and then looking at the care cascade, so thinking about all of the different parts of um, how a person moves through um, being tested for HIV and getting engaged with care, starting medication, adhering, persistence, uh, which is adherence over time, and then, and then eventually viral suppression, because the meds are really good. And so people with HIV live as long as people without HIV, as long as they take their meds. So really focused on that. Okay. So you saw those, and the thing is, I have a lot of papers on, on that stuff, but really, um, it's, it's the question of so what? And so, so like, what, what do you do with all that? So, okay, well, we can help people potentially cope with those stressors. We can help people reduce or eliminate the distress they experience. We can help them increase health behaviors to try and break those associations. And really, my work has been how many of them can we do at the same time? Because I only work in resource-constrained settings. And so all of it is kind of how low can you go in terms of the number of sessions and in terms of how little, how, how few degrees, how little training can a provider have because there's just, you know, there's a shortage of, of mental health providers everywhere. So the kind of bread and butter of my work is these interventions that co-target mental health or substance use and HIV-related health behaviors. And I do these trials, uh, these, these uh, <laughs> little snapshots of articles, each represent 10 years of research, um, two years, three years, and five years for one, and five plus five for the other uh, with my colleagues. So reducing um, sexual risk by reducing stimulant use and, and by reducing depression. It didn't make it into the title because it was already too many words. And then another, um, an alcohol reduction intervention in order to improve HIV-related health behaviors for sexual minority men living with HIV. So that's, that's, that's my work. And um, in 2020, I was invited to, um, to contribute a meta-analysis on that topic to the annual review of sex research. And this was really like the this is your life, David Panalone paper. Um, so about the 44 studies that folks have done in that area. And so... The good news is our interventions work. The bad news is they don't work as well as we'd hoped. The good news is, no, it's not good news. The bad news is they worked the best when there were nine or more sessions. And so the, there's always an argument between psychologists and public health folks in terms of NIH funding where the reviewers think you can cure everything in two sessions, but any healthcare provider knows that in two sessions you barely know each other. So anyway. Um, at least I finally have some good data to tell reviewers that they're wrong when they try and tell me that I can reduce depression and stimulant use and improve HIV-related health behaviors in two sessions. Okay, a f just a few other a few other lines of research um, that I'm not going to say that much about. Okay, well maybe just this first one. And so um, that's, this is a line of research that I've done with my um, with my social psychologist collaborator Laura Bogart, who's at Rand in Santa Monica. That's why I go to LA all the time. Uh -huh. um, and we, she used to be here at Boston Children's, and we, we were going to do a study about how um, black sexual minority men living with HIV, just thinking about how the intersectional stigma that they experience plays out. And it was actually our focus, you know, at, N, at NIH, the program officer was like, don't study that. Make an intervention. Like, don't tell us any more about how all these bad things are associated with, it, with each other. We know. So, so we used community-based participatory research. A um, lot of qualitative interviews, key informant interviews, and we made this intervention, and then we got another grant to, to make it um, with Latin, um, Latina sexual minority men with HIV, and then another without. And so it's really, it's a coping skills intervention in which we don't teach them any coping skills. I hope NIH isn't listening. Um, we, we do, actually, but one of the things we learned in our formative work was we don't need to teach people with a lot of marginalized identities coping skills. They already have them. Hello, here they are. And so that part of, the, part of what we've done is to help folks teach each other and that have, that have folks learn who have, um, especially, the, for example, that first, the first paper, we learned from the HIV positive black sexual minority men, they, they were so, um, they had vibrant coping skills repertoires for dealing with racism because every day, not as much for their dealing with HIV related discrimination, not as much for dealing with with gay-related discrimination. And so really what we try to do is get people to use those skills that they develop in one context and generalize. That's what it's called, skills generalization. So that's gone really well. That's been like four grants. 
Um, and then just going to say, Courtney Sprague, in this room at my new faculty orientation, I was fortunate to sit next to Courtney Sprague from the McCormick School, who also was another HIV researcher in the room. And so we've developed this own, our own line of research together about HIV-positive women in the South. Another line of research with a different colleague at Boston Children's, actually one of my grad school classmates, uh, who moved to Boston and soft money, she needs grants, I need collaborators. So um, we thought, what can we do together? So we ended up, um, again, a whole bunch of small grants to develop a dating and sexuality skills intervention for young adults on the autism spectrum. So just thinking about things that don't exist yet and need to. I write a lot for clinicians, trying to get the science out there um, as best I can. And then the question of what's next? I don't know. I'll let you know when I know. Thank you. Thank you, David. So I want to appreciate that you actually shared um, two beautiful works of art. One were the pictures of the sunrises, which say something about, you know, Marcelo, I'll steal your phrase, uh, our spectacular locational en endowment here. So thank you for that. But also, you know, talking about your multiple strands of research, right? To take those multiple strands, to over 200 collaborators, just on the published side of it, um, to draw from multiple disciplines, but then to take those strands and to weave a theoretical, a conceptual, a practical tapestry that helps people make better sense of their lives and be able to have, right, tap into the agency that, through, that comes with knowledge, knowledge that comes from rigorously produced scholarship. Um, right, that's a science and an art to put all of that together. So thank you for sharing that with us. And now I have the honor to present our third awardee, Professor Rachel Skaversky from the Department of Biology for the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Service. Yeah, you know, and I think, right, in the trinity, right, of teaching, scholarship, and service, we, we often sort of elevate the first two and say, okay, service is the thing we have to do. Let me say, service is the, the glue that holds everything else together. It is the foundation that elevates our teaching, that elevates our research, that elevates our mission. And when I think about all of the talented folks who have provided leadership through service on this campus, and we have a lot, Rachel absolutely comes first to mind. And so let me also tell you, the first time that I had uh, an opportunity to spend a little bit of time with Rachel is we took a boat trip together. Uh, to Nantucket and spent a couple of days there. And just getting to see, you know, spend some time and hear from Rachel, how important, right, it was to her to make sure that students had the opportunities, that colleagues had opportunities, that we were doing everything we could, right, to leverage the resources and the assets we have to fulfill our mission. That, Rachel, that was clear from that moment on. And so, but it wasn't just that moment. For more than three decades now, here at UMass Boston, Rachel has consistently demonstrated a superb level of service at all levels of the university and in the local, state, and national arenas. Her commitment and leadership in supporting underrepresented students in STEM is outstanding and merits recognition and it's one of the reasons our campus can be so proud that we are champions for diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. She has built a variety of initiatives over 30 years to diversify STEM education and raised millions of dollars to sustain them. Her leadership not only strengthens her department, but has had a significant impact across the entire university. Her service contribution, meanwhile, reaches beyond the campus to community and profession. The project she has developed at the local level with the Boston Public Schools, for example, and at the national level with Project Kaleidoscope, mark her leadership at all levels in diversifying STEM education. 
Her work is aligned with our mission, contributes vitally to new initiatives on anti-racism, and truly represents the best of who we are at UMass Boston. We are a university with a teaching soul, and Rachel, again, is an epitome of that. And as her colleagues note, her most impressive trait of the many is her faculty leadership. Her passion for making our university a leading model for access and success in STEM education comes across in the assessment of her colleagues and in the detailed assessment of her impact in the local, state, and national scene. Rachel, your tireless efforts on our behalf, on the behalf of our students and our communities, as well as your willingness to train, champion, and support others in their efforts to expand the understanding of science in the public sphere is truly remarkable. We are all better for it. And we look forward to learning more about your leadership through service. Rachel. I guess I'm not going to see some of you. Um, anyway, uh, first, I'd like to ch uh, thank our chancellor and provost for this very amazing honor. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues in biology for their generous nomination. But mostly, I want to thank my colleagues for working with me on, on many of the service projects that I've been involved in over the years. Um, you might think that I'm biased, but uh, the people in the biology department are really the best. Uh, they make up a really incredible community. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk to you today about diversity in science, uh, because several of the service activities have focused on that, and I thought that would be a good focus today. This figure shows the level of underrepresentation of women, Hispanics or Latinos, and blacks or African Americans on the science, in the science and engineering workforce in the US today. The unfilled symbols show how many more people would, need to, would be needed to represent the population. Now this underrepresentation is a serious problem for many reasons that I'm sure you are all aware of. First, it's, it's bad for science. Diversity in science can be an important driver of creativity and innovation. With this level of underrepresentation, science is missing out on the talents of large segments of the population, and our capabilities in science are compromised. Second, the ability of science to address the needs of the nation depends on the makeup of the science workforce. So for one example, this lack of, of diversity exacerbates ongoing problems of racial health disparities. Then there's the issue of science literacy and trust in science. We're seeing some of the dire consequences of citizens not trusting scientific evidence. I'm referring, of course, to issues related to the pandemic and to climate change. So it's critical to ensure that people of all backgrounds understand how scientific evidence is collected and used and that they engage in that process. So for this reason, we really can't afford for this reason as well, we can't afford to exclude significant subsets of the population from participating in science. And finally, the lack of inclusion that's implied here is bad for individuals who otherwise might fulfill their aspirations of working in science. So what I want to do is, is drill down a little bit more and look at the level of underrepresentation of these racial and ethnic groups at different educational levels. And this is actually a, a figure that, that, um, that you saw from uh, Tiffany's slide, let's talk as well. Now this figure compares the proportion of science and engineering degree recipients in certain racial and ethnic groups with their proportions in the US population. The top row shows the breakdown of different groups in the overall US population, ages 18 to 34. The lower bars show the representation of these groups at different degree levels. Note that at the associates level, the second bar down, the reddish brown bar indicating Hispanics is actually longer than in the top row, showing overrepresentation of this group at the associate level. In fact, we know from other data that interest in STEM among underrepresented groups has increased over the years. The proportion of people from these groups 
entering college in STEM fields has almost tripled in the past 30 years. That's the good news. Now let's look at persistence. We can see that as we move to higher degree levels, in other words, going down to lower levels on this, on this graphic, the representation of blacks and Hispanics gets smaller and smaller, indicating that many individuals who start out to pursue a science education leave the pipeline. This lack of persistence is a critical problem. I'd now like to tell you about a few of the programs that I've been involved in to try to address this equity gap, and specifically this issue of persistence. So here's, here's some, um, sorry. Um, this slide summarizes the research experiences for undergraduates REU program that I've been leading most summers since 1998. This is a full immersion uh, summer program aimed at diversifying the research workforce in the biosciences. <clears throat> um, it's a, we've served about 250 students, 10 per summer, mostly from underrepresented groups. Of course, a research training program is only as good as its research mentors, and here on the right are the wonderful mentors from biology who have been part of this program just in the last five years. RU students participate in closely supervised research experiences and an intensive series of professional development workshops uh, to build skills. We also have lots of social and general enrichment activities in order to build a very, very tight-knit community that students can strongly identify with and feel secure in. The second program is the NIH-funded Initiative for Maximizing Student Development, or IMSD. For this program, I've partnered with Adon Colon Carmona, and Leslie McLean is currently our program manager. This year-round program is aimed at preparing students from underrepresented and disadvantaged backgrounds to enter and be successful in PhD programs in the biomedical sciences. Again, we offer students carefully mentored research experiences, a full professional development program, and explicit preparation for graduate school. IMSD has also had several offshoot programs, such as our Research Immersion Lab in collaboration with Doug Woodham's lab. This provides three-week, full-time collaborative research experiences to groups of freshmen and sophomores who have never been exposed to research. So what have been some of our main challenges, the main challenges we have seen with these students from underrepresented and disadvantaged backgrounds as they come into these programs? Well, they have a low, low self-efficacy in science, that, that feeling of, I can't do this. Many feel, I don't belong here. They have financial barriers, of course. And many have little understanding of higher level science careers, and that applies both to the students and their families because of lack of exposure, of course. So what are some of the interventions that we have been using, that we have tried, in addition, of course, to the intensive skill building? and the research training. Well, we try to create a, a strong, trusting community to encourage risk-taking and a sense of belonging. We encourage students' identity as scientists. We provide holistic mentoring that encompasses both academic and non-academic issues. We try to convey our expectation of their success and then provide research opportunities with opportunities for, uh, research experiences with opportunities for success. We openly discuss the value of diversity in science as well as racism and the challenges they might encounter, such as implicit bias and imposter syndrome. And we provide lots of information about research pathways and provide opportunities for them to interact with role models from similar backgrounds. So what are some of the outcomes from these two particular programs? Well, here are some of them. Um, since 2009, although RU goes back a lot further than that. Um, and it is, excludes those that are still in, in college. A few of them are still in college. So most participants did go on to postgraduate programs in science or medicine, many to PhD programs. And all but a very small number stayed in science. Now this has been very, very gratifying work. The students have shown very good successes. And it's been a privilege to mentor them and be part of their journey. But before we get too complacent or self-congratulatory, we need to ask some questions. Are these programs scalable? First, 
Uh, and then second, how have these types of programs affected the whole picture nationwide? So first, is this scalable? Well, we're limited, of course, by the capacity of our research labs. And these programs are also very expensive. But we've been working to address scalability, um, at least for the research components. For example, we're using various models to offer large numbers of students shorter research opportunities in course settings. Some examples of that approach are the research immersion lab that I mentioned earlier, and also a course-based research experience that Labib Bruhana in our, in our department has developed recently. In terms of national trends, let's look at the outcomes over time, given that the government has been investing in programs like these. To what extent have such programs bent the curve and reduced the equity gap? So here we can see that the proportion of science and engineering doctorates awarded to individuals from underrepresented groups, that's the orange line, has increased substantially since 1980. That's good. But so have the proportions in the population, that's the blue line. And we can see that the increases for historically minoritized racial and ethnic groups has barely kept up with the increase in the US population as a whole. So the fact is, we have not closed the equity gap. And this is despite the government having invested major resources into this problem, and also in spite of the increased initial interest in science at the college level that we mentioned earlier. So why is this, so, why is this problem so hard to solve? What are the barriers? Well, of, of course, some of the causes of these problems are systemic and political in nature. For example, Students who have faced racial discrimination are more likely to doubt their academic abilities. Second, students from low socioeconomic backgrounds are likely to attend under-resourced under schools and receive weaker preparation. Furthermore, a recent study showed that even within schools, the disparities in acquiring science and math skills begin as early as kindergarten and then persist, and that these achievement gaps are correlated with family socioeconomic status. And as we all know, students of color also have fewer role models in science. But perhaps some of the barriers are related to the culture or other characteristics of science or science education themselves. Here are some interesting things to consider. A recent study concluded that even among students with similar high school backgrounds, students of color leave science majors at higher rates than white peers. If that's the case, and we can't attribute the problem entirely to poor preparation. It may suggest a perceived lack of inclusivity or comfort level with, with college science or anticipation of such problems in graduate school or science careers. Another recent study by the Pew Research Center found that only 20% of black adults and 26% of Hispanics see the science professions as very welcoming to people from their racial and ethnic groups. So these are obviously very complex problems, and I don't have the answer, of course. I do think that programs like the ones I described can be part of the solution. But I also think that we need to think very broadly. Here are a few of the questions that we might consider. Is there something unique to science, unique to STEM fields, apart from their quantitative nature, that feels exclusive? And if so, how can we change that? Do we as science educators unconsciously convey ideas about which, science, which students fit better in science? How can we make underrepresented and first generation students feel like they belong in science, that there is an expectation of their success, and, and that science can be their professional community? And how can we create a culture and curriculum that combines rigor, high expectations, and inclusiveness? Along with that, how can we provide the right supports at the critical points in our curriculum? And finally, I want to just circle back to the idea that diversity intersects with the issues we're facing today regarding trust in science and science literacy. I think that to address those particular issues, we will need to further community, in, we will need further community engagement about science. We will need more work with K-12 education and increased attention to general education courses in science in college. 
These courses need to help students understand scientific inquiry and, special, and especially how scientists scrutinize data and evidence. These actions, I think, will not only enhance science literacy, but can help to diversify the sciences as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. You know, I didn't know what you were going to cover, and I didn't see your slides ahead of time, but if ever there was a great example of how services leadership elevates our entire mission and cuts across right, the importance of both teaching and research in how we make a positive impact in the world, you just presented a master class on that. So thank you. So we're just about to wrap up the formal part of the program, and I hope that you know, everybody can stay and mingle a little bit, grab some treats, continue to um, appreciate and learn with and from our three honorees. But just a few um, concluding thoughts. One is, in hearing three of our most accomplished and celebrated colleagues talk about you know, who they are and how that relates to what they do, why they do it, and how it makes an impact reminds us that a university is people, right? A uni we have the locational endowment, the quads coming together, it's going to be beautiful. We have incredible programs here, but all that comes down to do we have remarkable people? The answer there is absolutely. And there's two lessons from today's presentations that I really want to focus on. One, that leadership does matter. Tiffany, Rachel, David, all three of you demonstrated the ways in which you provide different types of leadership that inspires and elevates all of us. But you also emphasize that it's not the individual, that it's how we work with teams and collaborate, learn with and from each other, that allows all of us to fulfill more of our potential but actually to do a better job of fulfilling our significant responsibilities at a public uni university. And you also demonstrated, in an age of misinformation, an age of doubts, of loss of trust and confidence in higher ed, in so many public institutions, and I'm using institutions in the broadest sense, two things really struck me. One is that evidence matters. Each of you talked about the evidence right, that informs your work and the way in which you know whether you are making a difference or not based on evidence. But secondly, the importance of inquiry. That is, what are the next questions that we need to ask? Right? That expertise is about as much about knowing what you don't know and who else you can learn with and from, and then What's the next meaningful question that will lead to not just further knowledge, but further impact? And finally, that um, reaffirmed how much we value and promote and dedicate ourselves to justice, diversity, equity, inclusion at the core of what we do. And it doesn't matter our field or our discipline. It doesn't matter what we study. It's how we engage others. It's how we not only inform our own work, but how we change our fields. That transcends the campus. You know, um, I think many of you know that you know, inclusive excellence has always been near and dear to my heart. I, and we cannot be excellent unless we are inclusive. We're also not being inclusive if we aren't providing excellence for all of us. The three of you demonstrated across Right, the trinity of teaching, scholarship, and service, how important it is that we lead with inclusive excellence. So as we come to a close, it's Thanksgiving week. And so I think the last theme right, is that it's appropriate to give thanks. And first, I want to thank all of you for being here on this special moment together in what is a busy time. So thank you. I want to thank. Um, all of the folks who served on the committees and who nominated um, folks, um, thank you. Because again, that takes hard work. And 
Thanks to my team and thanks to Rajni who helped organize the committees as dean of faculty. And I mostly want to thank David and Rachel and Tiffany. And I want to thank you not just because we're here. We're here because you have all been tirelessly contributing to UMass Boston, to our students, to our colleagues. So yes, we're honoring you. But what we're really doing is thank you for making UMass Boston a better place. So bravo. Thank you.